This is the atom. Oh, wait. That's not to scale. Well, fu- Way back in the time of Greek philosophers, Democritus looked at a slice of bread and thought, if I cut this in half, then in half again, and again and again, there would come a point where I couldn't cut it in half anymore. He decided that this small particle could be called atomos, meaning uncuttable. He later came to the conclusion that everything was made of atomos and that it came in many different shapes and sizes. For example, liquids were very spherical, solids were spiky, and oil was made of a very smooth and fine atomos. Sadly, his model wasn't very popular in his time because Aristotle proposed that the world was made of earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Seems very realistic, doesn't it? In their time, no one could prove who was right or wrong as there was little to assist in proving theories. As a result, Aristotle's model was accepted for thousands of years. In 1808, Downton looked at what Democritus thought and started his own research. With a way to prove his theories, he proposed that the world was made of small particles of the same shape. This is when the billiard ball example came into existence. For a while, it didn't catch on, but J.J. Thompson looked at it and proposed that atoms were pudding. That sounded better in my head. Thompson found that the atom was comprised of smaller particles, of which he called electrons. To make this understandable, he compared it to a blueberry muffin. Why does this class have to be before lunch? He said if you cut a blueberry muffin in half, there are many different blueberries, similar to how there are many electrons in the atom. And the muffin is held together by dough, just like the positively charged goo, countering and holding the negatively charged electrons together. This explanation sounded a bit strange, so in 1911, seven years later, Ernest Rutherford discovered that the positively charged goop was in the center of the atom, while the electrons floated around the outside. Then, just two years later, Niels Bohr explained that the electrons orbit the nucleus, much like the planets around our sun. For most, this model works. The school shows us this example every day, as it's easy to understand. But the atom goes even further. In the 1920s, Erwin Shai don't want to butcher his name, so hey, here's his name on the screen. He proposed that the electrons don't go in orbits, but more of a common path. From what I can understand, the electrons can be found in many different places around the nucleus, but they don't move in a perfect orbit. Instead, we find electrons in areas that look like this. We call these areas orbitals, meaning of or relating to an orbit. Up to this point, I've been talking about the electrons, but if we focus more on the nucleus, it's comprised of protons, discovered by Ernest Rutherford in 1919, and neutrons, discovered by James Codwick in 1932. So that's the history of the atom. I hope you learned something. Now, are there any questions?